It's another GPU launching that you can't buy. No, seriously. I've actually had a lot of fun playing games lately because we've had a lot of GPUs launch the last two months and I don't really get to play a lot of games anymore so it's sort of fun to play with this and do all that kind of fun stuff. This is a look at the AMD Radeon RX 6700 XT. This isn't the reference version. I did another review on the reference version. You can check that out. This is Sapphire's version and they have gone over the top for the Nitro Plus edition. Let's take a look. Fancy packaging. Now, personally, I think the RX 6700 is the good choice if you want to treat yourself, but also you don't want to feel guilty about the amount of money that you spent on the graphics card. Slightly guilty. This aesthetic should look pretty familiar to you. It's a substantial card, two and a half slots. I think two and a half slots for a 6700 XT is overkill, but there's no arguing with Sapphire's results here. This is an exceptionally quiet card. It was shockingly quiet. It was one of the places where the reference card was maybe a little bit weak when you max the fans out. It is pretty audible. When you max the fans out on this, the Sapphire Nitro Plus, it is barely audible. So at maximum fan speed, this thing is uh, quite a bit quieter. It's got two very large fans here and then a smaller fan in the middle. It's got the, uh, the ring on the side so that you get a little bit more static pressure through the heatsink. It is a copper heat pipe design and you do have full air pass through at the end of the card. So this is gonna you know, force some hot air up and out your system. Uh, it is definitely a much better cooling solution than the reference version, but it comes at a cost of being half an expansion slot thicker, having an extra fan. If you're worried about the fans, you know, wearing out and having to deal with that. These are the Sapphire quick release fans. So like you just pop out a couple screws, the, the fans come out. It's a really nice feature for uh, Sapphire cards and it's been on a couple of generations of Sapphire cards now. I really do like that feature. Sapphire knows how to put a good graphics card together. You've also got a digital RGB header right here and the Sapphire control software. You've got an eight pin and a six pin, which is standard or, you know, f standard in terms of like, that's what you get on the reference card. Overall, there's not really a lot here that's that's a lot different than the reference card. We still have one HDMI and three DisplayPort 1.4. The HDMI does support variable refresh rate, so if you're using a killer display like that uh, LG, you know, CX OLED display at 120 hertz HDMI, well, yeah, it'll do that. It'll do that, no problem. Another feature of this card that I really like is that it has a mechanical BIOS switch. Now, sometimes I use these, these cards for virtual machines and things like that on Linux where I'm passing it through. Sometimes the BIOS switch gives me a little bit of flexibility and a little bit of confidence to uh, maybe do some unholy things with the BIOS on the card. And then if I mess it up, I can flash over to the, the good BIOS or flip the switch over to the good BIOS, boot the system, and then flip the switch back over and flash whatever it is that I messed up. So having that feature is actually very handy to me when I'm doing you know, things like VFIO troubleshooting and, and building out the Linux guides. If you're gonna use this on Linux, you're gonna have to come to the level one forums and, and see my guide on, on getting it up and running. It doesn't quite work out of the box with most distros because you're missing some binary blobs. Uh, you'll have the easiest time on Ubuntu or Pop! OS. Um, Pop! OS could probably step up and, and publish their own uh, Linux firmware image that comes from the Linux firmware Git repository and, and solve that problem pretty immediately for Pop! OS users. But uh, once you get that binary blob firmware and you're running a relatively recent kernel, you're gonna have a lot of fun with Steam and all your other performance. And this is a surprisingly competent card for 4K, especially with older AAA titles, things like Shadow of the Tomb Raider. In terms of regular performance breakdown, well, we've got you know full benchmarks from things like Far Cry 5, Borderlands 3, and all the games that we normally test. How much better is it than the reference 6700 XT? Well, not dramatically better. It runs cooler, quite a bit cooler, and it runs quieter, so you could maybe expect a little bit more longevity as a result of the fact that it's running cooler, perhaps over the lifetime of the card. The overall game performance is pretty much about what you'd expect for a 6700 XT. There's maybe an extra frame or two here and there. Uh, in terms of overclockability, even the Nitro Plus version, there's not really a lot of overclockability here. You just sort of let the silicon do its thing and it's going to give you as much as it possibly can without causing crashes or, or other instability. Now this does support ray tracing. You can enable hardware ray tracing, but AMD's a little bit of a disadvantage um, versus NVIDIA when it comes to ray tracing. There's plenty of opportunity for more performance improvements over time, but 
you know, buying a video card on future promises, I'm not sure that's a that's a good idea. That said, it's not like you're going to have a bad gaming experience, and the ray tracing that is supported does work pretty well in my experience. Nvidia has DLSS, so if you're comparing this to the 3070, well, this card is going to outperform a 3070 until DLSS enters the equation. DLSS makes it so that the 3070 and other Nvidia cards actually have to render less pixels, so it puts these cards at a little bit of a disadvantage. It, AMD offers something called Fidelity FX, and Fidelity FX will let you do content adaptive sharpening and some other tricks. It's not quite as good, not quite as, as sophisticated as DLSS, but it gets the job done. Sapphire, on top of that, also has Trix Boost. This is a thing that they offer, which will create custom resolutions for you. Now, you can do it manually, like if you want to muck around in the registry and create a custom resolution that will be exposed in your game that's an oddball resolution. Like, say your game, you got a 3440 by 1440p monitor, and you want to run your game, and the frame rate is just a little below, like you want a 60 FPS locked, and every now and then it's going to like 55 FPS. Well, you could create a resolution that's just a little bit less than 3440 by 1440, like 3400 by 1400, or 3360 by whatever, and that might lower the number of pixels that your graphics card has to deal with, and the whole pipeline really, uh, to the point that you never drop below 60 FPS on your favorite title at 1440p. Trix Boost makes it to where you basically get all that functionality in a point and click GUI. You don't have to go mucking around the BIOS or, or anything like that. It's a pretty slick interface. I like it, it works well. It works well in conjunction with the 6700, which is almost powerful enough for you know, 60 FPS gaming uh, at 4K. At 1440p, 2560 by 1440, and 3440 by 1440, this is a really good card. If you're looking for over 100 FPS gaming in most modern AAA titles, this will do it. The 6700, the big differentiator is that you've got 12 gigs of VRAM. You know, everything else on the market is eight gigs of VRAM, maybe 10 gigs of VRAM if you look up the stack, but 12 gigs of VRAM lets you run really high resolution textures in your game. It's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a give and take though because modern game features like texture compression sort of funge uh, what we mean when we say graphics memory. Like a, a game might be allocating 12 gigs of VRAM or 10 gigs of VRAM, but in reality it's not actually exceeding the 8 gig capacity or 6 gig capacity or whatever of the particular graphics card that you're running. So it's really hard to do an apples to apples comparison. You can look at frame rates and you can look at where frame rates sort of drop because, oh, we ran out of texture memory, we gotta move some of the old textures out of VRAM, we gotta go get some textures from system memory or from disk or something like that. So having more VRAM, I mean, it's always preferable, especially at a given price point. And the price point for these, at least MSRP, does come in under the competition. So cheaper and more performance. The driver stack is a little different. The software is a little different. The level of polish on the driver stack and the end user experience is a little different. The competitors have DLSS, but this is still a robust card. If you see this card in stock, and you know, you've built your gaming machine and you're doing some upgrades and you're looking for a solid 1080p or 1440p gaming experience, uh, you wouldn't be disappointed with this card. You wouldn't be disappointed with the 6700 XT in general, and Sapphire has done a reasonable job uh, putting this graphics card together. I mean, it's a lightweight card. It doesn't feel like a brick, uh, like the, uh, the the prior gen cards w were. I would love it if this was a two-slot card instead of a two-and-a-half slot card, but I think most people would prefer to run as cool as possible, and the level of cooling that this cooler provides uh, is definitely going to put you in, in better shape in terms of cooling than the reference design. So, good job, Sapphire. Well, there you have it. That's been a quick look at the Sapphire Nitro Plus. I really want to revisit this card as soon as ray tracing is fully enabled in Dirt 5. Well, at least for AMD cards, that is. That's coming sooner rather than later, just a couple of weeks away is, is what I've sort of been told on the down low. Uh, I don't, you know, that's not official or anything like that. Don't take that to the bank, but I really think that uh, the Dirt 5 might be one of the showcase titles to show exactly what AMD cards are capable of in terms of ray tracing. Their hardware is a little different. I mean, to be sure, you know, NVIDIA hardware is a little different too. Hardware Unbox did a great video series where it's like, hey, the driver overhead on NVIDIA is a little bit worse than AMD. What's up with that? And it's like, well, it turns out that AMD cards have hardware scheduling to assist with the uh, DirectX 12 strategy for dealing with graphics. So DirectX 12 uh, tries to split the graphics pipeline to be handled better by multi-core machines. DirectX 11 is a little bit more single thread. In hardware, uh, there are certain structures that assist with that on AMD cards, on the NVIDIA cards. 
it's up to CPU processes to do that. And that seems to be why the NVIDIA driver has a little bit more CPU overhead than the AMD driver. So if you're in a CPU constrained scenario, an older CPU or a slower CPU, uh, the AMD cards will tend to pull ahead even more, you know, for a given price point than their uh, NVIDIA counterparts. And that's why that is. You should definitely go check out Hardware Unboxed videos on that because they just throw data at you to, uh, to drive that point home. And they did a really good job with that. So good job AMD on adding another graphics card to your uh, family lineup. I genuinely hope that you're able to find this in stock and that the stock levels have improved, you know, global shortages and all of that other stuff. I really hope that you're able to finish your gaming machines because what else are you going to do? I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. I'm signing out, and I'll see you later.